When I was in kindergarten, uh, we had a young lady that was in my class who was blind. And as is often the case in my life, um, we, we had a natural connection. And so as uh, we were, were getting to know each other as, as, as little five and six year olds, I learned a very important lesson early on in that adventure. I learned that it was not my job to grab her and take her places. If she wanted to go somewhere, she would reach out and she would grab hold of my arm and that was her indicator for me to lead her where she needed to go. She would grab hold of me, and then I would go. As we move into 2 John, verses 7 through 9 today, I want you to kind of get that image in your head. The idea of a person without the ability to see having to reach out and take hold of that one that's going to lead them. And with that image in your mind, I want you to stand with me as we look at 2 John verses 7 through 9 today and discover the standard of truth together. 2 John verses 7 through 9, and the word of the Lord says this, Many deceivers have gone out into the world. They do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, this is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you don't lose what we have worked for, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who does not remain in Christ's teaching, but goes beyond it, does not have God. The one who remains in that teaching, this one has both the Father and the Son. Let's pray. Our Father, as we look to your word today, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds to your scripture, to your presence, to your power, to your wisdom. I pray, Lord, that if there are any here that do not yet know you through the person and work of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that the truth of the gospel will set them free this day. I pray, Lord, that if there's any here that are wavering in regard to their commitment to the truth, that, Father, you would bring conviction upon their heart, that you would draw them back into the fold of your family, and that, Father, you would speak to us clearly and completely as we encounter your word today. And it's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. In the first six verses of 2 John, the apostle has commended the elect lady and her children. As we've said multiple times, we don't really know who the original recipient of this letter is. It might be a church that is especially fond of to John, or it may very well be an actual lady that is especially fond to John and to her children. But we do know it doesn't matter. Um, what we can absolutely understand is that they are faithful, that they are believers, that they hold a special place in John's heart, and that John is communicating very important and essential truths to them in the face of very difficult times and of rampant false teaching. And so in verses 1 through 6, John has commended the lady and her children, commended them for walking in truth and love and producing the fruit of that life through faithfulness and obedience. And now as John turns a corner in this letter, he begins to instruct on the destructive nature of false teaching and its impact on the lives of those who hear it. And so John begins with a statement of fact. He says, many deceivers have gone out into the world. Okay, I can buy into that. I mean, let's be honest. If you have turned on the television in the last two weeks, there has been a never-ending parade of dishonesty across our national headlines. It's a muddied mess. People are not telling the truth. Someone will say, well, who do you think is telling the truth? I don't know, because I wasn't there. 
And here's the reality of the situation though. They all can't be telling the truth. Somebody's lying. And it's everywhere. Deceit is everywhere. You go to your job. I guarantee you if you run a business, you will get a phone call this week from someone who will say something along the lines of, I can't come in today, I'm sick. They're probably not telling you the truth. Let's be honest. Most of us have met people. When they call and say they're sick, what they really mean is there's something good on the TV or there's something else I want to do. Or maybe they are telling you the truth. But let's be honest, so many people have lied to you over the years, we don't trust them anyway, right? I mean, let's be honest. Someone tells you something about half the time you're going, yeah, that's probably not right. Guys, deception is everywhere. And John says, many deceivers have gone out into the world. But they're not just telling lies. Their lies in this case are very specific he says they have gone out and they do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. At this time, there was a heretical belief going around and near the churches. It was a belief called Gnosticism. And in Gnosticism, what they really believed is that Jesus was not a real man. That he was, and I quote, an emanation far from the good and true God, but a demigod nonetheless and not a real man. And this doctrine was vile and destructive and divisive and it all centered on who Jesus is and what Jesus accomplished. And John is warning his readers of the danger of Gnosticism and false teaching around their life. John had a deep hatred of false doctrine. He declares this doctrine is the Antichrist. Now look, People have had as many views on the end times as there are people to have them. And we're not going to dig all that up. But let me be very clear with you. The only time that term is used in Scripture, it is used in John's letters. And it is always used in relation to false teachings about Jesus. In John's own words, if it's a false teaching about the real Christ, that is is the Antichrist. We don't have to wait for some guy to come on the scene to be that. These teachings produce that. And we must be on guard against it. Through false doctrine, the real Christ is opposed. And the true message of Christ is corrupted, leaving a broken and helpless message for a world dead in their sins. Why is this so dangerous? Because a false Jesus cannot save. The Gnostic Christ left man no better off than he was before the Gnostic Gospels came along. A Christ that is merely a creation from a greater God is less than the biblical Jesus and he cannot save. A Christ that is the first created being cannot save. A Christ that is less than 100% human cannot save. A Christ that was less than absolutely sinless cannot save. A Christ that did not literally die on the cross cannot save. A Christ that did not absolutely and victoriously rise from the grave cannot save. And yet, so often, it is a false understanding of the Christ that false doctrine latches onto and promotes 
and encourages. John has such a despite for false doctrine. And this doctrine in particular, that one of the great expressions that we use came from his mouth. Have you ever had someone tell you, oh, I can't come to church, the walls would fall in on me? Yeah, yeah. And we laugh and we go, well, that's so funny. Yeah, yeah. John went to a public bathhouse in Ephesus to bathe one day. And as he got into the, got into the bathhouse and was preparing to bathe, he saw one of the leading proponents in Ephesus of Gnosticism in the bathhouse. And wrapped in only his towel... He grabbed his disciples and said, we better get out of here quick. That vile heretic is here and the walls might fall in on us. And so towel clad John broke out into the streets of Ephesus because of his unwillingness to even be in the same room as someone who would pervert the true message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who he is. What he He's done. Guys, that's pretty serious. I don't know that I've ever gotten so mad about what somebody thought about Jesus, I'd be willing to run through town in my towel to get away from them. But don't think that it was out of fear that John took those kind of steps. No. Rather, it was a lesson to those who were his disciples for them to understand, you cannot compromise with false doctrine. You cannot allow them to plant the seeds of falsehood within the truth of the church. It will destroy the church. If you don't believe it, read the book of Colossians. Paul is writing to deal with much of the same falsehood and false doctrines within the church at Colossae. And he says, of all the good that you're doing, if you don't understand who the real Jesus is, it's all for nothing. It will destroy you. John is clear that you must watch yourself so that we don't lose what we have. John is not talking about salvation. Now, I want to understand, you understand that. Those who have trusted in Christ are secure in their salvation because of what Christ has done. But, he says, those who do not remain in Christ's teachings do not have God. So what does that mean? What does that, how does that, that jive? How do we pull that together? It's the loss of relationship. It's the loss of God's presence and God's power and God's guidance and God's direction in the life of that person. When we abandon the truth of the Christ... We are no different than a person who is blind that has let go of their guide in unfamiliar territory. And we grope and we struggle and we are confused and kept from what God has created us to be. Think about that. We are involved in a spiritual work. And for us to sell off what God is doing in our lives with His power and His presence and to give it away to the power of false doctrine. John says we must watch ourselves. We must guard ourselves. We must be diligent and we must hold firmly to the faith guys deception is everywhere I don't, I don't want you to sit there and think oh well we don't have to deal with Gnosticism today yeah we do sure we do 
Largest religious organization in Riverton is Gnostic. Just go ahead and deal with that. Um, fourth largest religious organization in Riverton is Arian. They believe Jesus is a created being, that he was only a man, that he was never God. Fourth largest religious organization in Riverton. So the first and the fourth largest religious organizations in Riverton have a false Christ that cannot save. Doesn't make them bad people. Doesn't make them these vile, wicked, you know, we kind of look at the heretics in the Bible and we're like, they sit around in dark places, in the bad alleys, and they're mean and horrible, and they're, they're these wicked folks. They're not. They're, 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 they're our neighbors, and they're our friends, and they're our co-workers, and they're our classmates. But they are bound to a false Christ. And when we talk about Jesus, they're not talking about the same Jesus. They're not teaching about the same Jesus. They're not recognizing the same work of Jesus. And we don't come to the same ends with their Jesus. You must hold firm to the truth of the gospel. Most of you have children. You must teach your children to hold firm to the truth of the gospel. Because let me be very clear, those belief groups are teaching their children how to hold firm to their beliefs and to take your children with them. If you aren't teaching your kids, they will be. You must teach your children the truth of the gospel, the eternal existence of a holy God, the eternally existing Son, the absolute humanity of the Christ, the only 200% man ever, 100% God 100% man, 100% of the time. The virgin birth, the sinless life, the atoning death, the victorious resurrection, the glorious promise of His return. Those are non-negotiable. He is the only mediator between God and and man, He is the only name under heaven by which we must be saved. That's who we're dealing with. And we must hold firmly to it. Because failure to hold firmly to it will result in the loss of all that we've gained. It's been interesting teaching church history this semester. What's amazing is how many people have gone to war throughout the course of Christian history and conquered land that they couldn't hold. Oh, you'd have this barbarian tribe conquer cities near Rome. But they wouldn't hold it very long because they weren't able to do so. They did not have the capacity to maintain the ground that they had gathered. And yet, in our lives, we do not lack the capacity. The power of Christ is more than capable of conquering every grain of sand that we ever put our foot upon to change the life of every individual we ever come in contact with. And yet... So often, we will give up the territory voluntarily because of our unwillingness to hold fast to the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll just give it up. Christ is calling us to hold firmly. John is writing with everything he's got to the elect lady and through history and time to us to hold firmly to the truth of the gospel. 
You want to know the standard of truth? The person and work of Jesus Christ. Everything is measured by the biblical revelation of that. And anything that doesn't measure up is falsehood. Is less than able. Guys, this morning I want to encourage you to hold fast to the truth of the gospel. If you're here and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there's never been a point where you have surrendered yourself to the message of the gospel, then I would implore you to do that today. For some of you, maybe you've been getting a little weak on what you believe. Maybe you have been a little derelict in the instruction you've given your children or what you've been enforcing your life with. And you know this morning that you need to to make things right between you and your Savior. Maybe you're here and this morning Christ has called to you and you know that you need to be obedient to His call and become a member of United Baptist Church. But if Christ is calling you today, this is your opportunity to respond to that call. In just a moment, I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. During that time of prayer, I'm going to make my way to the floor and Mr. Brian's going to come back to the platform to lead us in our invitation hymn. At the end of my prayer, he's going to invite you to stand and we're going to begin to sing. And if you need to respond to Christ today, what I'm inviting you to do is just step into any one of these aisles and meet me right down front here. That as Christ is speaking to your heart this morning, maybe about your salvation, maybe about any number of other things that the truth of the gospel has kind of gripped you with. But if he's calling you today, this is the time to respond. And as you come, I invite you to just share with me how Christ is working in your heart and we'll respond in an appropriate fashion to Christ's call. But folks, the truth is the truth. And only as we hold firmly to it can it produce the life we're called to live. What did we talk about two weeks ago? Love is rooted in truth. We can't love one another apart from the truth of the gospel. What did we talk about last week? The fruit of love is faithfulness and obedience. Guys, we can't be faithful. We cannot obey apart from a life that is rooted in the truth. And folks, we must hold firmly to that truth. If you will, I invite you to just bow your head and close your eyes as we go to the Lord in prayer and we begin our time of invitation together this morning.